our guest tonight is Lucha Underground star Paul London. How you doing, man? I am terrific, actually. A little hot, but that's the weather for you. Where are you located? <laughs> I'm in Southern California, uh, in the Los Angeles area. You could say anywhere, and it's the Los Angeles area. It's uh, it never ends. Your complaint, I'm in shitty Philadelphia with just the worst weather. It's raining. I can see nothing but gray. But, yeah, it must be so difficult in sunny California. Well, see, but I expect that kind of weather when I think of Philadelphia. My brother went to school there. And uh, every time I went to Philadelphia to visit him, it was always fairly gloomy. And so whenever the sun would come out, I went to school in Pittsburgh, which is kind of the opposite. You tend to get more sunshine over there. Um, whenever it was, you know, sunny in Philadelphia, you always thought you were kind of like it was candy camera. So you just kept waiting for the weather to turn. So. That is true. Uh, it, there, there's always a, a cloud filled with rain just around the corner, just as you're about to go out with the family or go take someone out on a date. It's about to rain always. You, you deserve it's, that it's weather. Weatherly, it's weatherly, weatherly love, right? Yeah, that is true. Exactly. <laughs> All right. Well, you know what? Lucha Underground returns Wednesday, May 31st at 8 p.m. Eastern Time on the El Rey Network for the second half of the third season. How excited are you for the remainder of season three? And what's the excitement level like from some of your coworkers? Uh, yes and yes. I think the excitement level for my coworkers is definitely elevated since the announcement you know of netflix um i believe one and two both those uh, first two seasons are currently airing and from what i've understood the plan and this could change uh this card subject to change right uh from what i understand as uh season three continues um they will then put on netflix what has already aired on season three up to that point um so it should be a pretty quick turnaround as far as the transition to Netflix for season three as well, uh, going into that second half. So it's, uh, for me personally, it's very exciting because, um, you know, as a performer, you want to get uh, somewhat of a gauge on the climate and on, you know, Hey, the people dig this. Is it, is it, is it absurd? Like did they just, is this the worst thing they've ever seen? You know, I mean, for me, I think this is a performer. I think is you tend to have, um, these cracks and these cracks tend to allow for insecurity to seep in in various ways. And so you always want to think that you're um, either ahead of the, the audience in, in a couple of steps, but uh, either way, you want to make sure that they're satisfied nonetheless. And so <clears throat> I think second half of this uh, season three will definitely reveal um, that we're kind of a bit more than just uh, – uh, jokesters <laughs> and fun guys, but um, there's a real evolution to, to our characters as far as the rabbit trap is concerned, personally speaking, um, just because it's something um, very different and colorful from the rest of the program. Um, and so, you know, we're very excited to to watch it continue to blossom out and see see what the reaction is. Mike, do you have your next question? What uh, Lucha Underground has done with the mid-season break, it's very unorthodox, and it's something that you don't really see in wrestling generally. So from your perspective, what are some of the biggest advantages and disadvantages uh, to Lucha Underground taking that type of approach? Um, well, it's definitely a ballsy approach. You know, I think Lucha Underground hasn't made it any secret that uh, they're risk takers and they're trailblazers. And so it's it's very neat to be a part of something like that, uh, you know, this kind of trend setting type thing where, you know, if you think about it now, you look at a lot of uh, show posters for independence, even the big leagues, wherever they are, um, card posters as far as the card itself. Who's going to appear on this event this weekend? I believe a lot of uh, the artwork and things of that nature have all really been influenced by what, Lucha Underground has brought to the table. So even from a design standpoint, they've really kind of uh, been trailblazers and really kind of revolutionized, I think, a lot of the approach as far as marketing. So that's very exciting. Um, but as far as taking that 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 second to, to make a break in between the momentum building of a season three, uh, like I said, it's ballsy, but I think it's well, it's just that. It's a risk. You know, do you lose that momentum? And do people think, oh, yeah, you know, I was so excited to see what happened. I'm going to have to remember what happened and this and this and this. Um, well, I think it's quite the opposite. I think in wrestling, especially in the current climate where everything is just a constant um, overfeeding, 
um, and it becomes just, you know, a binge type situation. I think it's good to be able to pull that back and, and make people wait so that there's that hunger that rebuilds, you know, and it just continues to build back up um, because, you know, the product will deliver and you figure, hey, these guys didn't take a break to come back with a dud. So there must be something that is either going to jump the shark or really be something to remember. Um, so that excitement kind of organically starts to uh, mature in its own right in the individual as opposed to just having the same ice cream fed to you every day or every week, I should say, you just, you know, and you, you know what you're going to get. And, um, I don't know. I, I get very oversaturated on, on just a lot of the wrestling that's out there now. And I, I tend to not watch any of it just because I can turn away and come back and I'm still going to be seeing the same thing. So, um, I think it helps continue to separate it from the rest of the herd and saying, Hey, we're not really, part of the cattle um, or something completely different uh, and it forces you to watch. Brandon Gavin, next question. Well, we're big fans of your character in Lucha on the Ground and the influence is clear, but how did the Rabbit Tribe character and storyline come about from a development process? Oh, you'll love this. Um, <laughs> so I, um, I it come through as a real deep love of mine. And uh, at the time I was studying a lot of Kung Fu, I um, since uh, haven't studied as much lately. I always study Kung Fu on my own, but as far as being in a class, an organized class, uh, it's pretty heavy uh, while we were filming throughout season three. Um, I'm sorry, of season two. So I actually kind of appeared at the end of season two in a test run, um, kind of as just me. And... Um, I, I guess there was this, this weird mindset where I was thinking like, hmm, you know, like I want to try and use some of this Kung Fu in my matches and let's see if it really works. And, <laughs> you know, just that kind of thing. But it tended it tend to make my character more serious. And um, I had this match with Devoy. It was in the very final taping of season two. Well, thankfully it didn't air because it was really a stinker. And um, so fast forward to... Uh, the, the, I guess the pre-production for season three, and I'm kind of kind of down on things at the moment because I'm thinking like, man, I really want to come back as something kind of fresh and something that connects with who I am as a person, but just something that I can show up as and people say, oh my god, I didn't know that was him. That's very different. Um, we're excited, and so. Um, we were kind of approached with this, I guess I should say I was approached with this idea of this rabbit trap thing. I thought, um, okay, I love battle beasts, uh, but I don't know if this is quite what we're thinking here. I was thinking more battle beasts <laughs> at the time. So and for those of you who don't know who, what battle beasts are, it was this toy line in the eighties and it was kind of these miniature, uh, animals that wore armor and, uh, I guess I'm, does anyone do you guys know what I'm talking about? Or am I just yeah. way off? The no, no, no. It's, okay. you, this is the, the exact uh, show where that will land with us. <laughs> we'll land with our fans okay. too because it, it, this is it, we're children of the '80s. I love those. Things. Okay, perfect. I'm in the right audience. I, I, I entered <laughs> yeah. the right theater. Okay, <laughs> and, I think they even have like little holograms or something on their chest. But either way, um, so I envisioned. Uh, here's another one for you. I guess Warriors of Virtue. I was kind of thinking like this kind of thing. You know what I mean? Where I was thinking, okay, we're badass rabbits because ain't nobody gonna be laughing at us, man. Like, because automatically you're thinking, okay, we've got you know a puma, we've got a moth, we've got people from the dead. Um, before, you know, this is before the snake people, so we didn't quite have them yet, uh, but we do have a dragon. Um, you know, we've got guys from space. You know, it's just this it's, it's huge uh, spectrum of characters. Um, but then you think of adding kind of this furry, friendly, fun character, like a rabbit, you know, and it's like, man, I, I just don't want it to turn into this tricks of the kids kind of thing. Um, so I think on a defense, my mind instantly went battle beast, warriors of virtue. Um, well, that was not the approach either. <laughs> so that was like strike two <laughs> in a way. Uh for yours truly. And um one of my current members was a part of that battle beast experiment. But the general feedback was you guys look like scuba divers and we can't tell who's who. Uh 
so then it was okay let's let's just throw the drawing board away let's break it up and smash it up and take it out to the to the field like the uh like the nerd dude in office space and let's just <laughs> let's just play gangster on this on this sink board here because it's obviously not working um and then uh christy joseph who's um kind of this uh i'm not gonna use the word genius because i think that's a real hoard out term but he's um he just has this direct cleverness that um you, when he spits something out, you kind of sitting there like, why did I see that? Like, that's so, it, 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 it's just like a fat free type of creativity. Um, he has a really efficient mindset that it gets right to the, either right to the punchline or right to the, the joke or the real crux of the, the scene or whatever. And um, she goes, no, 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 no. We're thinking like Alice in Wonderland. And when the second he said, Alice, he didn't even have to finish the in Wonderland thing. My like everything completely went through the looking glass, so to speak. And I thought, okay, you want oh, so you want to go here? Okay, let's talk because this is exactly up my alley. <laughs> he must have been looking in my window. Um, he might have been. He's a pervert. Uh, <laughs> but all, but aren't we all? <laughs> you know? So. Um, so then my immediate response to that, you know, he's thinking, oh, I was thinking more Mick Jagger and Freddie Mercury, and I'm just sitting here thinking, I was thinking more Freddie Mercury and Cod Pieces and um, Elvis and, you know, this kind of thing. And so I, I remember responding with, I think, a page of eight to 12 different attachments of just Cod Pieces, like close-ups of Cod Pieces. And I thought, this has to be a part of it. Um, because this is where my character's power will emanate from. And uh, in, well, in truth, in truth, listen, guys, in truth, all of us as individuals harness our power in our crotch area. And, and I know it, I know it sounds funny. I know it does, but there's a reason we call it a private parts. So there's a reason that there's a lot of vulnerability right there at that kind of epicenter of our existence. And you know, it doesn't matter if you're male or female or or, or both combined. Um, you know, you're gonna you're gonna have that that region um, where there's there's a lot of vulnerability and there's a lot of power. I mean, you really harness so much power in that crotch area. So um, so that's that's really that that kind of became a seed in itself that really kind of turned into this sort of thing and. Um, and, and it was just almost as though we started to finish each other's sentences and it's like, oh, this is, oh, that'd be great. Oh, that, oh, this is exactly, oh, that'd be awesome. This is, uh, and, um, and we really wanted each character to be where, Hey, if you see them in a match, you, you know, it's this guy. It's not just like the red one or the blue one, <laughs> you know? <laughs> um, you know, so, and I think we did a really good job with that for that first half, as far as, making sure each individual had their own kind of personality and flavor um, to add to the group because I wouldn't want to, I wouldn't want to do any of this stuff without those guys. I mean, it, it, it's, it's the most at home in a, in a me kind of, this isn't much of a stretch kind of way uh, as I've ever done, but it also allows me to uh, really feed off of the creativity, which I've never been allowed to really do in a wrestling circle at least. So, um, yeah, we're stoked for, for the rest of season three. We're super stoked for it. Ship I don't even know if I answered your question. So yeah, I just... Believe me, whatever just happened, I enjoyed it. But I, I, have, it was great. I have to shift gears from the power of the crotch for a second. Uh, and let's, sure. go, let's go on to, to the signing process. You're a big part of what Lucha Underground is doing. Again, we, a lot of people are genuinely excited for what is the rebirth of Paul London in this new character. So for you, what was the signing process like? Um. Well, uh I guess I should say it involved like gluten-free pancakes. That was part of the courtship. Um, but, uh, no, I mean, honestly, season, season one was airing when I was actually, I had moved back to Austin where I'm from and I was running a wrestling school there. And um, so I was sitting here thinking, Oh, this is, this is interesting. You know, Glover Rodriguez has kind of created this world and 
Um, I don't think they shoot here, but it would make sense if they did. It turned out they shot in Los Angeles and Boyle Heights, and uh, it's a real warehouse, uh, working class, uh, kind of Mexican-American neighborhood. It's awesome. Um, and it's right on the edge of Los Angeles. And uh, so I thought, well, that's, that's really neat, you know, and I, I didn't pay a lot of attention to the, to the product because I was just really trying to focus on my training at the time, but um, a lot of my friends worked there, and I, you know, I was really happy for them to get TV time. So then I had made the decision to move back to Los Angeles for acting purposes. Um, why else would anyone move to LA, right? Uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, I get this really great job at, uh, you know, Burlington Coat Factory. Um, <laughs> So, <laughs> but uh, so I moved back to Los Angeles, and um, a friend of mine uh, who works as bail, um, Benny B Boy, said, "Hey, do you have any interest in possibly talking to guys at Lucha?" And I thought, "Well, yeah, of course. You know, it's here in L.A. I'm here in L.A." Um, and so he kind of put us in touch initially. He goes, "You know, DeJoseph, right?" I was like, "Yeah, DJ's awesome, you know." So DJ and I spoke, and um, we just kind of liked the rap of each other's thing. I think as far as what we didn't want to be, you know, as far as like, well, I don't want to do this. I'm not really into head dropping. I don't want to do, you know, I don't want to show up as be like this. I'm the toughest guy in the yard character. Like it's so cliche and boring. Um, so it was more so of just, Hey, I, this is what I don't, this is what, this is what I don't like about wrestling is this. <laughs> and it was like, well, I agree. This is what we don't like about wrestling either. Oh, what do you know? We have so much in common. Um, so then um, I was supposed to actually, I think, set to start in season two, and then I hurt my knee pretty bad. And so that's where PJ Black came in and um, really did much better with that spot than I probably would have at the time. Um, and PJ's awesome. I mean, he just, I don't know anybody that can move or make things look so effortlessly, uh, easy. I mean, he's so fluid and he's a big guy. I, mean, I don't think people really understand like how big he is as far as, um, the strength and like thick, he's a thick guy. Um, and he's a crazy son of a bitch, jumping out of airplanes and stuff. I love the guy, but he came in and took that and kind of went right into that position. I think it was initially, uh, thought of for me. So then I had hurt my knee, and I was just really kind of in this depressed uh, wrestling mindset that tends to happen, you know, more often than we care to admit. And um, again, kind of coming to my rescue, um, I was really starting to spiral. Uh, you know, they said, "Hey, would, do you want to come on board as a producer as well?" And it was just kind of like hearing those bells, you know, when you just like classes out and you can just relax and you're like, Oh wow. Like what a, what a breather, like what a second chance. Um, and I thought this is, an, this is an amazing opportunity to come and really flex some completely different muscles. Um, and I had no idea what I was doing. I mean, I, you know, I knew what I didn't like about producers I had worked with in the past, but as far as doing it myself, um, you know, it's kind of, I'm not going to say it's an office position because I don't look at it that way, but um, when I'm not in the ring, then there's a good chance that I'm, I have a headset on <laughs> and I'm kind of helping direct some action, but um, it's, it's all, it's all in the performers. I and mean, I'm not going to take any credit for any of that stuff, but uh, I do tend to throw some ideas in the mix here and there. And a lot of them tend to get used <laughs> Uh, and it's neat, you know, it's neat to be in a situation where you can have collaboration and where you can speak in a, an idea, no matter how absurd the idea might be. Um, and you're not going to just get a, a, a drum roll of eye rolls. You know what I mean? Ragland just kind of thinks like, oh my God, like who hired this idiot? Um, and, and you're not going to get um, a condescending remark or like a response or, or a, you know, you're just not really going to be insulted as a human being. And that is really what makes the environment. Um, and I'm talking just from a backstage standpoint, uh, it's just different, just different, it's completely different and enjoyable. And it, it really makes you look forward to going to work and seeing what kind of amazing stuff you can create with an amazing cast of, uh, not just performers, but, you know, the makeup crew and the, 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 um, 
with the ring gear crew. I mean, there's several people that work just on, you know, like a whole team of designers and, um, and it's just amazing, this, this kind of universe that's being created. Um, so it's neat. It's neat to really be a part of that and to say, hey, you know, you could go and just run off and join the Golden State Warriors, uh, or you could really go and try and go to uh, an expansion team and see what kind of success you can organically create together. And to me, that's way more uh, rewarding and, and refreshing um, especially as a performer, because you're always trying to look for ways to reinvent yourself, you know, at least to not grow stale. So, <laughs> um, yeah, it's anything but stale. And I'm, uh, yeah, very, very excited to be a part of it. And to see who else can get killed, you know, that's that's really the old thing. It's just who can die? Who can we, <laughs> who can we kill? <laughs> and me, I could die too. I mean, who knows? I could die and there could be some sort of psychedelic orgy and I come back to life. Um, okay. Now I, mean, I need the, that. The possibilities I I, are endless. You need to talk to Krista Joseph, friend of our friend of the show as well. I uh, will message him as well. The psychedelic orgy does sound like something that will sell. Okay. I'm not sure, but in today's land wrestling landscape, I think that's different enough to where that will sell. So, <laughs> okay. Yeah. I mean, who knows? Right. It was just, it was just, Throw it all on the wall. Something will stick and slide down. <laughs> okay. Well, again, switching gears, some psychedelic orgies. This is very difficult. This is a difficult uh, interview for me to handle. Um, you're but aren't you glad it's not just the same old, same yeah, old, like, well, honestly, you know, we uh, went to the game board and we came up with a plan and we're glad everyone's happy. It's, uh, it's, <laughs> that is nine out of ten interviews we've done recently. Not shitting on anybody, but thank you. Uh, <laughs> your former tag team partner and friend Brian Kendrick found success in the Cruiserweight Revival in WWE. As a former Cruiserweight champion, uh, what are your thoughts on the division? I know you said you didn't watch a lot, but what are your thoughts on the division yeah. and Kendrick's recent run? Uh, well, I mean, let's see. I watched – I only watch – uh, 205, I guess. Is that, I only watch the, the show or whatever whenever I'm at. Okay, whenever I'm at someone's place that has the network. So it's pretty rare because none of my friends in Los Angeles, actually one of my friends in Los Angeles has the network, um, but he's really so busy all the time. Uh, he's a, he's a, a big, big producer. <laughs> so whenever he has time, I would hang out. Maybe I'll watch some wrestling uh, on the network. But other than that, if I'm on the road, um, like I was just hanging out with a buddy of mine, uh, JT Dunn, two weeks ago, and uh, I saw a little bit of Kill Five. Um, I, I don't know. I, I, it still kind of feels like a Divas Revolution thing to me, um, where, and I think it's just because the ropes are different. Color, like they, they, they want it to be such a standout product so bad that they almost kind of overproduce it as though, as they're known to do with everything that they, that they touch. Um, Cause let's be honest, as I always say, that other show is anything but raw. Right. Um, so um, I think with 205, I, I'm trying to think of what we saw. It was something from like a week or two ago. And, it, and, and so correct me if I'm wrong. So is 205, it's live, right? Like right after SmackDown? Yes. That's right. Okay. So we were watching it, and I didn't watch SmackDown, um, which is sad because I consider that kind of my old uh, stomping grounds more than anything. Well, Velocity, let's get specific. Um, <laughs> but I uh, – the show started off with like a big talking segment. I just thought like, didn't I'm pretty sure it's probably not SmackDown. It started off with, a, with like a big talking segment. So you've gone through all of SmackDown. Now it's like this show with characters that you're maybe kind of familiar with, maybe not as familiar with, but nowhere near the, uh, the push or the draws of what you're going to get on SmackDown. Um, so that's like the after party show. Um, but you know what? Let's start this party off with a bang and let's have a talking segment. So I just thought, huh, this is its strange. You know, it's really it was strange. Um, I can't say I'm a real fan of what I've been seeing on there just because um, I guess it does seem to have just a, a ton of preservatives and uh, it, it just doesn't taste very good. And I'm not saying that just because I'm me and I worked there and I didn't have the greatest of times at times and this and that. Like, it has nothing to do with that. 
Um, I think it's just because I feel as though I'm watching a video game and um, I only really like video games when I'm standing up and I have a pocket full of quarters and I'm at an arcade. Uh, so to sit there and watch a video game that you don't actually have the control in your hand uh, to do anything about it, it's kind of frustrating. Um, especially when a lot of it doesn't make sense to me. So uh, it kind of just reiterates why I don't watch it. <laughs> um, but as far as um, Brian's character, uh, I, I, I don't know. And the few times that I've seen, I guess I'm still trying to figure out if he's like a psychedelic pirate or like what, or like an ice pirate. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I don't, I'm just, I'm, is, is that, is that what people in Venice do? Uh, like, uh, I mean, I've been to Venice a lot of times I and mean, a lot of weirdos. I don't know. I guess I'm trying to think if I was walking down the street in Venice beach, California, and I saw this guy, with sparkly cheetah pants uh, and a jacket that looked like it was a fucking excellent arts and crafts project um, <laughs> walking down towards me. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what I would think to myself. Um, I guess it would be kind of scary. I think he's scary, if anything. I think his character is really scary. Um, it's because he seems angry. And I, I guess I'm, I don't know, the verdict's still out. I'm still trying to figure it out. Um, I don't know, can you guys help me out a little bit? No, I honestly cannot. I, <laughs> I think, think you've described it perfectly, yeah, honestly. I agree. <laughs> but I don't, here's one thing I don't, I, I don't, I mean, I, I do like his, uh, I do like that he's used this um, different finisher, like a submission finisher. It's, it's something that looks like, you know, when applied right, it could really hurt. Um, and I do like that he has done that just because, um, I mean, let's be honest, he really hoard out his sliced bread, you know, to where it was like, you knew everyone was going to kick out of it. Um, and so you, you know, I, I, I remember watching, uh, Master he had a while back in Ring of Honor, um, with Silas Young, who's awesome. I love that guy. Real man's man. And, um, <clears throat> Brian had hit him with the sliced bread, kicked out. He hit him with some, like, super sliced bread off with, like, both on the top of So I was kicked out. And I thought, okay, well, who's going to possibly believe that Brian's still going to win this match? It's obvious he's not going to win the match. Of course he didn't win the match. But I just thought, where else can you go after that? As far as, like, they've, they're just not going to buy it anymore. So I, I, was, I thought it was really refreshing to see he used uh, a completely different finisher. I should probably take um, some note from that. <laughs> Although I'm pretty protective with uh, my shooting star, but I should still take some note of that. Um, just in that it's good to have a good variety. And I do. I mean, um, there's definitely more tricks up my pant legs than up my sleeves. But, uh, you know, tricks are for kids, right? Didn't we mention that earlier? We did. We, this This interview has... Gone off the rails and back on to oh, and like off it. of it again. We've had psychedelic orgies. What do you guys I've really about expect? Now? What do you guys really expect? I mean, there is there we go. Well, you know, I like to have tea before the show, <laughs> and uh, you know, have to be a uh, certain temperature. I'll get really mad. <laughs> My cottage has to be a cool seventy-eight degrees before I can put it on. Otherwise, I just won't even have it. You know, that's not a bad idea. Yeah, With the more... chillo. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I don't know. You know what? Th there it is. That's the end. We're gonna end right there. A huge chill though. Chill though. <laughs> you got chill though. I'll put an ice pack down there. It's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> a huge thank you to our guest Paul London. Catch the return of Lucha Underground season three on Wednesday, May thirty first at eight p.m. Eastern time on the L Ray Network. Tell the fans where they can support you, man. If you're on Twitter or Instagram, the handle's the same. At London Foo, L O N D O N F U, like Kung Fu, not like any other foo. Uh, and you all have a foo inside of you. You just, you know, you got to bring it out. So, yeah, at London Foo, Twitter and Instagram. If you see anything on Facebook, it's a phony. As most things are on Facebook. So that's perfect. <laughs> that's, so true. Yeah, that's true. That's true. I left it hanging. Sorry. <laughs> uh, a huge thank you to our guest, Paul London, again. Thank you, man. Good luck moving forward, sir. My pleasure, guys. Hope to do this again sometime. Thanks, y'all.